I'm a little nervous right now because uh, tomorrow is going to be a very traumatic day. Uh, I am having my new passport photograph taken. <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean, and you never get it right, can you? I mean, like, for the next ten years, I'm going to open these. Obviously, me. <laughs> Is there anybody here that has a passport photo that's anywhere near normal? And, and no, I mean, all the women look like Lulu, <laughs> and all the blokes look like Mongo Jerry. <laughs> I've got this passport photo. I've got a kipper tie with a knot the size of Anglesey. <laughs> And you have to show this when you go through passport control. And wherever you go throughout the world, passport control officers are always the same. I don't know, they have the most abysmal sense of humour. <laughs> the millions of photos they must see, and every single time they open the photograph and they go... <laughs> <laughs> it is my contention that airports are more traumatic than flying. Right? Because when you get through passport control, what is the next port of call you go to? The conveyor belt with your luggage, <laughs> if you're lucky. <laughs> this, is, this is getting like Dunkirk now. I mean, it's right, isn't it? Everybody has to pack up right to the conveyor belt. Right there. Because they've got to get their luggage first. They get their luggage. No, you can't get in. No, get out. This is my space. This is my space. <laughs> And have you ever seen a baggage handler? <laughs> you look for them, don't you? You look for in that big square hole with all the dangly bits coming down. <laughs> you try and spot a baggage handler. They're like the Yeti. <laughs> they must exist. I mean, you know, you've seen their footprints in your luggage. <laughs> And why is it that the biggest piece of luggage on the conveyor belt always belongs to some 95-year-old biddy in a wheelchair? <laughs> and he's like, anybody up? No, no, no. I'm trying to get my own bloody luggage. What's the matter? <laughs> the last time I stuck her on the conveyor belt, you know. <laughs> but for me, the most traumatic experience in an airport is to have to go through customs. Isn't that traumatic? I mean... Don't you feel guilty? <laughs> You're as clean as a whistle, but all you can think about is Midnight Express. <laughs> you, and you can never remember what, how much you can take through. Is it eight litres of still water or four? <laughs> and it changes all over the world, wherever you go. I mean, the Middle East, you can't take any alcohol in whatsoever. And, and Mexico, Mexico, you can't take avocados in. It's illegal to take avocados into Mexico. Like, I mean, you try putting one of them in a condom and swallowing it. <laughs> I have real trouble going through these customs because I'm, I'm, normally I'm carrying a, a guitar. Right? And if you carry a guitar through customs, forget it. I mean, you might just as well have a sign tattooed on your forehead, drugs bad and search my body. <laughs> And they, every time they stop me, they ask the same stupid question. Uh, what's in the guitar case? <laughs> you have to bite your tongue, you have to bite your tongue. The one time I said, uh, a mouth organ. <laughs> My feet never touched the ground. I was in this room, you know, and they sent a baggage handler in with a big latex rubber glove on his hand. <laughs> But Birmingham Airport is the worst. I have to say that. If ever you go through the customs at Birmingham, they are red hot. Don't try anything. This summer, I came back, I came back. I bought a watch, right, in Spain, off a beach salesman. I must have been mental, but I did it. I mean, I did it with a sangria, I think. And I was lying on the beach, you know, with a towel over my toes, up to my nose here. And a, and a nose guard on, you know, and a big hat and sun oil all over here. And he came up and he said, English? <laughs> How they know I will <laughs> So I said, what do you want? He said, would you like to buy a watch, you see? And uh, I, I went, oh, it was a beat sound. Anyway, it was a brilliant beat sound. I have to say, he was brilliant. That's why I bought it. He sold it to me at 12 o'clock precisely. Brilliant. <laughs> there's only one damn hand on the thing. <laughs> <laughs> so this cost me like 40,000 pesetas, this thing. So, so I'm coming in into Birmingham. I'm going to the customs. and I thought, I'm not paying duty on this. I'm not paying duty, so I stuck it down my underpants. <laughs> I'll never look there. 
Right, and when you go through customs, as you know, you look in any direction you can except at the customs man. Correct? Right. Yeah. So I'm walking through with my trolley, and I didn't know that this watch had an alarm. <laughs> <laughs> and it was the birdie song. <laughs> I'm walking through the green channel and you can hear dee 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 I thought, don't turn ahead, just look straight ahead and go. And I almost got away with it. Almost, I was almost through the green channel and a bloke recognised me. He went, hey, carrot! How you doing, eh? Got the time on your cock? Now we've had a whisper about a rumble. Whisper about a sparkler's black. Hatton Garden. Savvy? Sorry, sir? <laughs> Lone faces with shooters. Blagging sparklers. <laughs> Blagging sparklers, eh? Bastards. <laughs> now the rumble came from my grass. <laughs> Uses a drinker in the elephant. Excuse me, sir. You say that your grass is rumbling. <laughs> Seems like a dicky bird. Where does the elephant come into that? <laughs> the face is in the blagger from the elephant. And you've got your rumbling grass from the elephant as well, sir. That's right. Any whispers from your grass, Briggs? <laughs> no, sir. Louis, any rumbles from the elephant? <laughs> My elephant? <laughs> Not likely, sir, no. no. Now, the sparklers. Dave. All heads up. Read anything one. about rumbling elephants in the police handbook? <laughs> Just keep glasses. nodding. Maybe we can persuade him to call a vet. <laughs> Louis, are you receiving me? Sorry, sir. Right now, I want you in the elephant tomorrow morning. Sparrows. To pick up the chummies with the sparklers. <laughs> Got it? You can depend on us, sir. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Excuse me, landlord. We're detectives. I was wondering if you could tell me where we could find the local police informer. <laughs> We've got an appointment. <laughs> Looks like your typical salt-of-the-earth South London villain. I'll deal with this. Watch her, me old cock spatter, me old china. I was there indoors then. I was the old trouble and strife. <laughs> Apples and pears. <laughs> Dog and bone. Ruby Murray. <laughs> you must be the pigs from the factory. No, we're police officers actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. We're pigs. And we've come for a rabbit about the rumble in the elephant. Well, you'll get no rabbit from me until you give me a monkey. <laughs> I'm not saying a dicky bird until you give me a monkey. Oh. Did you bring a monkey? <laughs> yeah, a monkey. Of course I didn't bring a monkey. <laughs> Why not? Well, it's not the first thing you think of when you leave the house in the morning. truncheon, airy primate. <laughs> okay. Make it a pony. <laughs> <laughs> no pony, no rabbit. Well, could we owe you a pony? I could bring it round to your house later on tonight. I need it now, this afternoon. Whatever for? Because I want to put it on a dog at Catford. I'm <laughs> <laughs> for Mr. Briggs or Mr. Lewis. No, I'll, sh I sh I'll get it. I'll get it soon. Yes, sir, Briggs. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Just a moment, sir. 
It's a super. He thinks he's David Attenborough. <laughs> Apparently he's had a rumble that the faces in the elephant have sussed that we're pigs. And a bloke called Mad Dog is sending down some gorillas in a motor to turn over the fox and goose. <laughs> They close early round here, don't they? <laughs> On for the road? Yeah, why not? Have you got any real ale? No. Oh, I'll have a Campari then. <laughs> or the bag of pork scratchings. <laughs> oh, great. Company. Fancy <laughs> little glass, lads. <laughs> This week, we're going to learn how to be best man at a wedding. <laughs> the best man's responsibilities begin well before the actual morning of the wedding. Your first duty is to oversee the stag night, which traditionally takes place on the eve of the big day. The stag night is an ideal opportunity to reminisce about old times, to renew old acquaintances. <laughs> But you mustn't allow the proceedings to get out of hand. Ideally, both best man and groom will be safely tucked up in bed by midnight. Because a sound night's sleep is essential. <laughs> the big day itself arrives. And now your first priority must be to get the groom ready in time for the wedding service. <laughs> One of your main duties as best man will be to organize your team of ushers. You should make sure that they're waiting for the wedding guests at the door of the church and that they separate them into bride's family and groom's family. As your guests arrive at the church, you may discover that there aren't enough pews to seat them all. If this is the case, do try to be economical with the space available. <laughs> Now for some last-minute checks. Do you have cash? Do you have a pen to sign the register? Most important of all, do you have the ring? Are you sure? Are you absolutely sure? Fine. <laughs> Supporting the groom and providing the ring are, of course, a vital part of the best man's duties. The ring should be discreetly handed to the vicar in readiness for that blissful moment when this token of love and affection can be slipped onto the bride's finger. <laughs> the happy moment, the bride and groom are all together for the first time. The best man's speech. Make it witty. <laughs> Make sure everyone can hear. <laughs> Your final task is to see the happy couple off on their honeymoon. Not forgetting the traditional ritual of decorating the couple's car. <laughs> what does a man know that charber? Nothing. But he's got to be there at the birth. He was there at the conception, he's got to be there. <laughs> and we know nothing about it. I mean, we fool everybody that we do, you know. I mean, uh, I, mean I, I went to one. I mean, I, you know, my wife, the first one, I went. I was useless. I mean, I just, I just fainted out. <laughs> I missed everything. I, I woke up just in time to see the afterbirth coming out. <laughs> I didn't know. I thought, what an ugly bastard. <laughs> All the people in the delivery room are going, he's just like his father. <laughs> I've got a mate of mine, he's about 35 years old, he's one of the new men, see. So his wife's pregnant. And so, within three weeks, he's a fully qualified gynaecologist, you can imagine. <laughs> he'd done all the breathing exercises and the sympathetic morning sickness. You know, he'd had 12 pints the night before. <laughs> And on the day of the birth, he walks into the delivery room and he's loaded down with cassettes of whale noises and <laughs> herbal pillows, you know, and, and just takes over and, like, tells everybody to get out and, like, she doesn't want, she doesn't want any drugs. No, she doesn't want the epidural. No, she wants to go through the pain. Because if she doesn't have the pain, it interferes with the bonding process. 
pillock. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you put up with this? Why do women put up with this? I mean, if I was a woman, I wouldn't. I wouldn't have my husband at the, at the birth of my child. If he insisted on being there at the birth, you know what I'd do? You know what I'd do? I'd insist on being there at his vasectomy. <laughs> Have a free old day! <laughs> Couple of days before the operation, walk round the house with a pair of garden shears. <laughs> Just to get him in the mood. <laughs> get the boy scouting from next door, teach him a couple of knots in case things go wrong. <laughs> and on the day itself, oh, go to town, get a, get a woman surgeon. Much more embarrassing, much more embarrassing. <laughs> And, and rule the place, you know, no, no painkillers for him, no, 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 it's unnatural. <laughs> Besides, he won't be able to hear the whale music. <laughs> so when they're about to start the operation, you can shout useful things out like, Scalpel! <laughs> Mallet! <laughs> Chainsaw! <laughs> and the thing is, when he wakes up, that's the best time, when he wakes up, just be sitting by the side of his bed with a couple of pickled onions in your hand. <laughs> and say, I told you to go private. <laughs> I had a vasectomy once. Well... <laughs> what I meant to say is, like, I went to have a vasectomy once. I chickened out, to be fair. I mean, I'd, uh, I'd you know, I decided to have one and uh, I didn't tell the missus it was going to be a surprise. <laughs> and I actually went, I actually booked in and I was uh, in the clinic and I chickened out. It was basically the pre-op routine that, that scared me to death because uh, I was sitting there and, um, and the nurse came in and I don't know whether you know, but when you have this operation, you have to have, um, you know, your groin shaved. <laughs> and I didn't know. I mean, I was totally naive about this. And she came in and she said, um, right, Mr. Kellett, time for a shave. <laughs> oh. <laughs> How considerate. <laughs> So she led me into this room, you see, and there was this chair in the room, and it was like a dentist chair. And she sat me in and put me legs in stirrups. <laughs> oh, it's a bloody funny shave. <laughs> so I sat there like this, you know. She said, uh, no, hang on, Mr. Kelly. She said, uh, I'll be away a couple of minutes. I'm just going to get the Willy Barber. <laughs> the Willy Barber? <laughs> And it suddenly struck me what would happen, you know. And sure enough, two minutes later, this matron burst into the room. She's like 14 stone, you know. <laughs> this real evil glint in her eye. I thought, I've seen you at Nuremberg. <laughs> and I went through the most degrading experience of my life. I mean, I got, first of all, she pulled my trousers down. <laughs> you know what she did? She went... <clears throat> <laughs> I thought we're back at passport control, eh? <laughs> And she put these big latex rubber gloves on. I said, uh, did you ever work at an airport? <laughs> and then she put a face mask on, a face mask. I thought, what the hell's going on, you know? And then she grabbed me like this. <laughs> I'm not radioactive, you know. I haven't got anthrax. So she starts soaping around, you know. <laughs> then she gets out this 10-inch cutthroat razor. <laughs> I have never been so still in all <laughs> I was motionless. And it's easier said than done, that, you know, because, like, while she's shaving away there, my groin was trying to go... <laughs> <laughs> so she's shaving away, and she's saying things like, uh, been on your holidays lately? <laughs> cold for the time of year, isn't it? <laughs> well, it's a bloody barber shop, this. <laughs> and I looked round the room and sure enough, there was all these photos on the wall. <laughs> all these groins and all the different styles. <laughs> and when she finished, she got a mirror. She started showing me what she found. <laughs> a little bit more off the side. No, thank you. <laughs> I said, what damn mess she'd made of it. God knows how many times she'd nicked me scrotum. I, I mean, I was covered in these little bits of paper stuck all over. I was out of there like you couldn't believe. And do you know what she said as I left? Do you know what she said? She said, something for the weekend? <laughs>
problem, love. It's flight wrappers in the plug hole. <laughs> You know, there's nothing like it. The atmosphere. The, <laughs> and, uh, the atmosphere. I mean, I've got two brothers. Uh, one's a pilot with airfix, <laughs> and the other one's a raw plug. <laughs> Good luck to them. They're very happy, but at the end of the day, I only ever wanted to do one thing, and that's score goals. I've been very lucky, really. I mean, I'm signed to a good club. There's a great team spirit and all the lads are really well painted and that. <laughs> and it's a tough game. Quite recently, I picked up a bit of a niggly injury. In fact, the Alsatian trod on me and my head snapped off. <laughs> Obviously, it's one of those games where you do tend to get pushed around a bit, but, you know, if you get knocked down, you've just got to bounce back again. After a hard match, the lads all like to let off a bit of steam, you know, with a few lagers at my local club. <laughs> Sometimes really get out of our box. <laughs> that's a Smith, that's our goalkeeper. He's a real one for the ladies, eh? He's always getting picked up by the girls, he is. But I'm just using him because of who he is like. <laughs> My wife Michelle is brilliant and really understands the sort of pressure I'm sort of, you know, <laughs> under. We both like to have kids really, but unfortunately we've got a bit of a sort of a problem where that's concerned. It's not a big thing. <laughs> that's the whole problem. <laughs> that's football, isn't it? You know? <laughs> Tingle. Oh, 
would say it was a, I would say it was a, was it was a, was a tingle, tingle. tingle. <laughs> you get a little kind of, you know, tingly, ingly, wingly, pingly feeling all around your mouth. You know? Wingly, pingly. Wingly, pingly. Hey, what's this? What's this? What's this? What's this? It's an Oxo cube. No, it's not an Oxo cube. Okay, back to the Nick. Everybody. Come on, everybody. Everybody back. Back behind the barriers. Everybody get back behind the barriers, or we will open fire! Hey, Pete! We will open fire! Open fire! 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 Everybody out, there's a fire! 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 fire. 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 What? I can't move my leg! <laughs> back to the nick! Back to the nick! More oxo. <laughs> Are you driving? <laughs> you are. I'd better change gear then. <laughs> no! For that sake, slow down! <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, this program, as you know, goes out after the watershed. Uh, this is the time on TV when all children under 11 are deemed not to be viewing in case they see something that they shouldn't. Instead, they're upstairs in the rooms watching a video of Deep Throat. <laughs> the watershed is actually at 9pm, after which you can say or show things that earlier could possibly corrupt young and immature minds. 9pm was chosen, apparently, because it's the time Mary Whitehouse goes to bed with a good book. <laughs> and burns it. <laughs> anyway, now all the kids are in bed, let's talk about something that we don't normally talk about when they're around. Like kids. <laughs> I can't stand them! <laughs> Snotty nose, loud mouth, repugnant little baskets. <laughs> No bastards. <laughs> you see, the problem is, every generation of adults is going to have to find a way of dealing with the rebellious children. Young children are the same as they ever were until they pass through the poo stage. <laughs> now, every parent knows about the poo stage. This is when the child is that age when poo is the most hysterical word in the English language. <laughs> Everything is poo. So, Hello, what's your name? Poo. <laughs> what's your age? Poo. <laughs> what do you want for dinner? Poo. <laughs> I'll give it to him. Serves him right. <laughs> then after the poo stage, kids used to go on to those sort of marbles and conkers and things, that stage, but, but they've cut to that. Now they go straight to the disco stage and Kylie Minogue. Hey? from poo to crap in one go. <laughs> but what worries adults today is the sophistication of children. You see, they are so much worldly wise than we were. I mean, you ask a child today, what is 14 and 27? And they'll say, chicken chop suey and pancake roll. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not that they can't comprehend mathematics. I mean, far from it. I mean, when the tooth fairy came to my kid for the second time around and left exactly the same amount of money, there was an uproar. Huh? Hasn't the tooth fairy ever heard of inflation? <laughs> Doesn't she know there's an economic recession on? I mean, I can't believe it. My kid wants to index link his molars. <laughs> and children are so much more aware of the environment these days. I mean, in supermarkets, they know everything that you should or shouldn't buy. What's that you're buying, Daddy? Um, a bog cleaner. Is it biodisposable? <laughs> no, it's toilet duck. <laughs> 
choosing a holiday isn't easy. Oh, we're not going to the Mediterranean, I'll be daddy. Oh, it's full of fecal matter. <laughs> It'd be like swimming in a cesspit. A cesspit. This, this from someone who just 18 months ago lived in the toilet bowl. <laughs> I'm stuck halfway up the u bend because Action Man had gone scuba diving. <laughs> A big bone of contention between adults and children is clothes. Can you get kids to wear short trousers? They don't want to know. No, we look ridiculous in short trousers. But now you look fine. No, we look ridiculous. Well, I wore short trousers. I wore them for years. I wore them till I got married. <laughs> the mere thing. And as for pumps, they wouldn't be seen dead in pumps. It's got to be trainers, high top trainers with them sort of tongues that like cricket pads and <laughs> stuff, great immense things. The only thing you can't do is train in them. <laughs> Unless you're trying to get on It's a Knockout. <laughs> and of course, no kid can be seen going around these days without his bum bag. Do you know what they are? They're those nylon pouches they tie around the waists. Like the equivalent used to be a jamboree bag. You know, with sherbet and pink shrimps and love hearts and spangles. Oh, not anymore. Now it's bum bags containing a bottle of ginseng pills and <laughs> vitamin A cream, royal jelly and a packet of Durex ribbed. <laughs> and that leads us on to something else, maturity. You see, it's not what kids do these days. It's that they do it so much younger. I mean, they reckon that in the 60s, the first sign of puberty in a girl was around about the age of 15. 15? Blimey, girls are 15 today, going through the menopause. <laughs> and what happened to innocence? Do you know that I'd recently picked up a copy of The Dandy? You know The Dandy? And there was an agony column in it. <laughs> an agony column in The Dandy? <laughs> there was these letters like, Dear Irma, I'm nine years old and seven months, and I'm going out with a boy much younger than me. He's only just turned nine. And he's so immature. <laughs> he has an attitude problem about me going out with older boys. All because I accepted a date from Bill Wyman. <laughs> he's taken this very badly and he's threatened to take an overdose of Lego blocks. <laughs> it's no joke, last time he tried it, he was in agony and passed two cranes and a dumper truck. <laughs> And there's another thing, toys. Kids' toys, they give me nightmares. They're horrendous things, have you seen? I mean, do, do you know about Transformers? Like, if, if you're not parents, I've got to tell you about Transformers. These are, these are sort of things that turn from homicidal, brainless mass murderers into motorway service stations. <laughs> or you can buy charming little models called skull-sucking alien warriors. <laughs> or even worse, teenage mutant ninja turtles. <laughs> Have you come across these? They're sweeping the country. Teenage mutant ninja turtles are a bunch of reptiles who were deformed by radioactive retro mutagen slime and they now <laughs> live down a sewer led by a rat who teaches them karate. <laughs> what happened to Play-Doh and Hector's house? <laughs> I fear for the future, I really do. Do you know there's a toy shop opened up in Birmingham called Nazis Are Us? <laughs> <laughs> and have you been to a kid's party lately? I mean, it used to be simple. You'd supply them with three times their own body weight in jelly, <laughs> pin the tail on the donkey, a magician, a game of British bulldog, two broken legs, and they'd all go home happy. <laughs> you can't get away with that now. I mean, you'd never get away with jelly. It's got to be creme brulee in the shape of George Michael's crotch. <laughs> And the entertainer, what chances has he got? I mean, these kids have been brought up on meatloaf concerts and Ozzy Osbourne. A clown called Mr Cupcake with a red ping-pong ball on his nose. He's got no chance, has he? Within two minutes, they've copped hold of him, they've strapped a ghetto blaster to his head, they've wired his knees to the mains and he's breakdancing into the creme brulee. <laughs> Instead, they've invented their own games to play now, like pass the joint. <laughs> Pin the willies on bros. <laughs> and an erotic game of leapfrog that bears no resemblance to the game. They, they don't climb off. <laughs> This week we 
take a look at the caring, highly qualified and supremely professional work of the fully trained ambulance man. The modern ambulance man is fully equipped to deal with any emergency and one of the most important aspects of his job is dealing with on-the-spot medical treatment. the one-man operator has to be both driver and navigator for the sometimes urgent journey to the hospital. There are those who claim that Britain is moving towards a two-tier medical system, but the diligent ambulance man will treat both his private and NHS patients with the same high standards of care. <laughs> on NHS resources means that the ambulance man must make the best possible use of his facilities and equipment. Even if this does mean cutting corners occasionally. The ambulance man is caring, compassionate, courteous and kind. And that's why he's one of the most highly respected members of the community, with a close circle of friends and admirers. Yes, well, thanks anyway. We should have done this ages ago. Ted should be taking it easy at his time of life, not working himself to the bone. And as for the garden... Oh, hello. Is that Jenkins? I need a little help. Come around any time when he's not here. Any day except Tuesday. Ted, could we have a word? Uh, Rosie and I have noticed that the garden is getting a bit much for you these days. So, um, we were thinking, would this be any use? I'm getting to that age when I'm starting to worry, you know, because my last birthday was one of those sort of milestone-ish birthdays. One of those things you don't actually admit to, but it's there. I mean, without putting too fine a point on it, I'm into 40-something-ish. 
And it's, very, it's a very difficult age for you because, I mean, you get all the books about being teenagers and babies and old age, but no one ever caters for, the, like, the 40-year-old. And it's very difficult, you know? Because, like, I mean, you, d you don't think you're ever going to be 40 for a start. I mean, when you're 18, you think everybody over 40, like, you know, plays dominoes and smells of Vic. <laughs> And you think, I am never going to get old. Oh, no, I am going to stay young. But the onset of time takes over. Things happen to you that you have no control over whatsoever. Right? Because, like, for instance, somewhere in your early 40s, you lose your dress sense. <laughs> Someone comes in the middle of the night and nicks your dress sense. <laughs> You do things. You do things you have never ever done before. Like, I mean, for instance, for instance, you'll be walking down the high street, and just momentarily, just momentarily, you'll pause outside of Dun and Co. <laughs> <laughs> and you're thinking, hmm, <laughs> nice cardi. <laughs> And you, and you start wearing slippers. When you're 40, you start wearing slippers. Not ordinary slippers. Oh, no, no, no. But those tartan zip-up booty ones. <laughs> With the bubble on each toe. <laughs> and the thing is, you forget to take them off. They're so comfortable. You, you go walking around Harrods in your noddy slippers. <laughs> People are going, what the hell is he wearing? What's up with him? Oh, he's 40. <laughs> it's a very, very difficult age. You look forward to things coming through the post, like the K's catalogue. <laughs> Not that you ever buy anything from it. I mean, you just look at all the models in the underwear, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and, and when you're 40... <laughs> I've just remembered it. When you're 40... Have you ever seen 40-year-old dance? <laughs> we haven't the faintest idea what we are on about. I mean, look, we, when you're 40, somehow you always dance with your thumbs in the air. <laughs> And you think you're so cool, you know? You look like a crab with mad cows, do you see? And you just think, oh, please God, please God, let me grow old gracefully. Because, I mean, there are people who don't. I mean, there are people who refuse to admit that they're old. I mean, I mean look at the Rolling Stones. I mean, typical. What a geriatric caseload they are. But, and they're on tour again, being rebellious. At their age, <laughs> I can't get no synatogen. <laughs> I've got this reputation of going into hotels and tidying the rooms up. <laughs> it's a difficult age. Not only is it a difficult age, you start to think, actually, you start to think, how much time have I got left? And it's, it's a pretty sobering thought, because... Um, I mean, if you take the average lifespan being, say, three score years and ten, I've got about, give or take a little bit, about 25 years to go. Yeah? And when you work that out, that's actually 9,000 days. <laughs> I have got 9,000 days left to live. <laughs> it doesn't sound a lot, does it? <laughs> I mean, all those things you want to do and you've only got 9,000 days to do them. But you haven't, you haven't, you see, because when you start working it out, I mean, for a start, you've got to sleep. Right? We spend a third of our lives sleeping. That's 3,000 days out the window straight away. <laughs> so you're down to 6,000. And then I started to think about it and got a little bit paranoid. And I thought, well, what else has got to go? And then I thought of all the time we waste. I mean, masses of... I mean, Sundays. Sundays are a complete waste of bloody time. I mean, you don't do anything on a Sundays. What do you do on a Sunday? You get up, you know, you get down to the boozer, have five pints, come home, fall asleep. That's it, isn't it? I mean, the highlight of Sunday is 6.30 at night and you've got to guess the colour of Harry Seacombe's anorak. <laughs> there's 1,200 of them. Good, really. So 4,800 left, and then what? Then what? Then you've got to drive, right? You've got to drive. I worked it out. On average, you spend three hours a day at the wheel. Four hours if you live in damn London. Right? That's three years behind the wheel. Three solid years behind the wheel. That's, that's, that's 150 hedgehogs. <laughs> and all the other things. Car keys. Can you ever find your car keys? Where the hell do car keys go? Every single day you look for your car keys. I'm going to spend 31 days looking for my car keys. <laughs> That's where Lord Lucan is. He tied himself to a Peugeot key fob. That's why. <laughs> where do they go? My dog eats my car keys. That is the conclusion I came to. My dog eats my car keys. My dog, Rover, eats my car keys. <laughs> 
Well, he doesn't think his name's Rover. He thinks his name's Get Off the Bleeding Couch. <laughs> <laughs> it's either the doctor or it's my eldest daughter's boyfriend. It's this snotty nosed glue sniffer from Wolverhampton. <laughs> Pain in the neck he is, eh? He keeps laughing at me slippers. I'll put one on him one day. <laughs> and then. And then washing, brushing your teeth, all those things, I mean, they add up, they add up, you can't believe it. And bodily functions. I mean, you've got to go to the lavatory, haven't you? I mean, well, you have, and I mean, without getting too crude about it, I worked it out, like that's six times a day, on average, about two minutes a time. I thought, good God, I'm going to spend three months on the bar. <laughs> three months on the bar? I'd be like living in a Barrett town. <laughs> So I got it down to two and a half thousand days. And then I thought, work? Of course you've got to go to work. Nobody really rates work, do they? Like five, five days a week, eight hours a day. That's, that's 2,986 days. I thought, grief above, I've got 14 days left to live. <laughs> <coughs> and sex, sex, I forgot sex. <laughs> well, you've got to have sex, haven't you? I mean, what's that? I mean, I don't know. I mean, if you, if you get it down to the basics, you know, you, you know, forget all that snogging and taking your shoes off, I mean, <laughs> what are you down to, what, I don't know, 12 seconds a week? <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, forget the foreplay, nine. <laughs> nine seconds a week for 25 years, that's, that's 24 hours of solid orgasm. <laughs> Boy, what a day that's gonna be. <laughs> I should wake up next morning looking like Keith Richards. <laughs> God's got a sense of humour, hasn't he? I mean, look at his ratios. One day of full carnal knowledge and three months on the bar. No, no. I've got 13 days left to live. No, I haven't. No, I haven't. I forgot cash points. My God, the time is spent in cash points. Hey, do you want a mortgage? No. Do you want a national insurance policy? No. Do you want a timeshare? No. Do you want a pension? No. Do you want cash? Yes. Position closed. <laughs> I worked it out, I'm going to spend 18 days at cash points and I've only got 13 days left to live. I thought, last Saturday I died. <laughs> okay. okay, the man at the back is called Ted Galloway. He runs a bar just outside Malaga. This is his wife, Mary. And this is their villa overlooking the harbour. This is my sister-in-law, sunbathing. <laughs> As you can see, the weather was smashing. <laughs> That's my Uncle Jack on a donkey. <laughs> and this next one was taken in a lovely little taverna around one of the back streets. <laughs> Hi, Sergeant. Lights. And next year we're going to try Tuscany. <laughs> right, any questions? No, sir. Oh, by the way, I've got a little assignment for you two. Oh, good, a chance to cut some crooks. <laughs> a couple of days ago, we picked up Scarface Jack McBride. Hitman, underworld big shot, bank robber. He's a hard man, one of the old school. Refusing to name names. Says he won't squeal to a copper. <laughs> well, we're going to plant someone in his cell. Someone that he'll trust. Good idea, sir. Someone that no one in his right mind would believe was a policeman. <laughs> Very cunning. Well? <laughs> so, what are you lovely ladies in? In for? In prison for? Yeah. What did the filthy Melvin Peck get you in for? Me? <laughs> oh, uh, Speedy. Speeding. In an aeroplane. <laughs> Speeding in an aeroplane. I nicked this aeroplane and, you know, <laughs> just started going too fast in it. <laughs> what about you, pretty boy? Who, oh, me? Lots of different things. Such as? Oh, lots of major crimes. Shoplifting, arson, fighting with big blokes in betting shops. 
Any, uh, GPH. GPH? Yeah, <laughs> you know, the old, old GBH, yeah. <laughs> Great big hold ups. Grievous <laughs> <laughs> bodily harm. And that. So, what are you in for then, Macca? Walking on the grass. <laughs> I put you in here for walking on the grass. <laughs> Thompson, I think his name was. <laughs> and I maimed a couple of coppers. See, there's one thing I can't stand. It's coppers. I can smell them. <laughs> so, uh, tell me, Jack. Why do they call you Scarface? <laughs> <laughs> I like him in the lights a joke. <laughs> you get nicknames? Oh, yeah, yeah. Hundreds of them. Some people call me the killer, and others just call me Mad Bastard. <laughs> At school, they used to call me Spunky. <laughs> Pop to the loo. Yeah, must be all that tea I had at the station before I came. <laughs> Railway station. <laughs> Excuse me, officer. I wish to go to the loo. Uh, if you're looking for the Kazi, son, you're standing on it. <laughs> <laughs> you mean? Yeah, unless you want to hold it until recreation time. When's recreation time? Uh, 23 hours, 24 minutes. 23 hours? That's barbaric! That's criminal! I mean, what about, you know, like, number twos? <laughs> Always in the bucket. Number ones, number twos, number threes. <laughs> I can't believe this. Nothing you can do about it. We'll soon see about that, eh, Dave? Oi! Screw! We want a proper laboratory in here, all right? We're not animals, you know! We want a proper bomb! Hey! Screw! Give us a loo! <laughs> number one! <laughs> and number two! <laughs> Oi! Screw! Give us a loo! For number one to number two! <laughs> It struck me during rehearsals this afternoon that can Callot is really karaoke. <laughs> but without the music. I mean, I'm here reading the words on this card and you're sitting there. Listening. <laughs> you know, I've put up with some fads in my time, but this karaoke is the pits. I mean, I've suffered slip discs with hula hoops and tennis elbow from yo-yos. I broke my wrist with Rubik cubes. I got VD from Cabbage Patch Dolls. <laughs> DDT from Cabbage Patch Dolls. <laughs> Your writing, Jill, is terrible. <laughs> now it's karaoke from Japan. Well, of course, it would be from Japan, wouldn't it? There's always some form of ritual self-humiliation where they're concerned. <laughs> karaoke is a Japanese word. Uh, kari comes from harikari, 
to kill yourself. <laughs> so, carry means yourself or you. And uh, oki is Japanese for pillock. <laughs> So it's you pillock. <laughs> There's actually a pub in Piccadilly in London that has a Japanese karaoke night when only Japanese tourists can get up and sing. And I, I went along one night and it's, it's, it's really weird. I, I turned to this Japanese tourist standing next to me and I said, I think karaoke okay. Well, he gave me a filthy look, you know, one of those you build railway looks. <laughs> <laughs> and then I realised what I'd said was, I think you pillock, OK? <laughs> anyway, it was a great night. And there were these Japanese belting out songs like Bridge Over Clubbled Waters. <laughs> Ray, Ray, dee, Ray. <laughs> of course, the ever popular Pearls a Harbour. <laughs> Come on, I'm allowed one a show, come on. <laughs> Every time I see karaoke, it reminds me of that TV programme called Stars in Their Eyes. It's hosted by Leslie Crowther, who introduces all these people who claim to look and sing like their favourite singers. Uh, there's been some great moments. I, I don't know whether you've seen it. Look, there's the bloke who impersonated Sting by coming on and giving us a three-hour lecture on the rainforest. <laughs> and the Johnny Rotten lookalike who gobbed all over Leslie Crowther. <laughs> and the Glenn Miller impersonator who never turned up. <laughs> but we're actually getting to the stage now where the public are getting more famous than the stars. Have you seen You've Been Framed? Yeah. 16 million people watch that every week. It's where Jeremy Beadle introduces amateur videos of people making complete prats of themselves. <laughs> Mind you, it's hard to tell when the comparing stops and the videos begin. <laughs> <laughs> Time was you had to do something to be famous. You know, invent the telephone or discover penicillin. I mean, today, if you've got some marvellous invention you want recognition for, you've got to go on TV AM and get hit on the head with a rubber hammer by Timmy Mallet. <laughs> then there's a case in point, Timmy Mallet. He hits people on the head with a rubber hammer and he's more famous than John Major. <laughs> I can't believe it. I mean, it comes to something when an insignificant strip of wind with nothing more to offer than an irritating voice and a silly pair of glasses becomes famous. And as for Timmy Mallet... <laughs> In a way, Andy Warhol was right. You know, one day everyone will be famous for 15 minutes. But fame is it's like a drug, and once you've sniffed it, some people just keep coming back for more. You know? Take David Icke. <laughs> <laughs> what a career he's had. Ex-goalkeeper, snooker commentator, Green Party spokesman, and now, son of God. <laughs> It's a modest little claim, that. Isn't it? <laughs> Just one step away from the big one. His other, his other modest claim is he's come to save the world. <laughs> well, he saved bugger all when he played for Coventry City. <laughs> but supposing, just, just supposing, he is who he says he is, the son of God. I mean, anything's possible. I mean, OK. OK, first time he came around as a carpenter with long hair and a cow gown. So now he's a goalie in a turquoise jumpsuit and a bubble perm. <laughs> and he was born in Leicester. Yes, it falls down there, doesn't it? <laughs> Where are you going to find three wise men and a virgin there? <laughs> but it's still possible, and if it is true, just think, just think what Christianity will be like in 2,000 years' time. I mean, for a start, it'll be called Ikeanity. <laughs> I mean, you hit your thumb with a hammer and you'll be going, David Ike! <laughs> <laughs> he was born in April, so that's when we'll have to celebrate Ikemus. <laughs> Easter will have to move to June, because that's when he was crucified on the Wogan show. <laughs> All the pilgrimages will have to change. Coventry City Football Crown will become a shrine 
and thousands of people will visit the ground and stand in the penalty area, genuflecting with the sign of the goalpost. <laughs> well, he was a goalie, he hated crosses. <laughs> All right, two per show, OK. okay. <laughs> then from there, they'll move on to the Crucible in Sheffield, where the Lord David preached the holy sermons of the Embassy World Snooker Finals and the parable of how the mighty Alex the Hurricane was slain by Jonathan the Parrot. <laughs> you took your time, man! <laughs> Church services will have to change a bit. The priests will all be wearing Adidas sweatshirts and goalie gloves, giving Holy Communion a piece of meat pie washed down with a mug of Bovril. <laughs> In the name of the Father, the Son, and the goalie ho. <laughs> Meanwhile, the congregation will be singing hymns like hymn number 224, Who's the Bastard in the Black? <laughs> and number 308, You're Gonna Get Your Kinhead Kicked In. <laughs> This week, how to be the perfect father. <laughs> For most modern men, fatherhood begins at the moment of birth itself, and many will be present in the delivery room to offer help and to support their father. <laughs> many men also like to take along a small camera so they can record the birth for posterity. <laughs> Surrounded by the high-tech paraphernalia of the modern delivery room, your wife will take great comfort from a helping hand and an encouraging word. Very often, the midwife will give the father a specific task, such as watching the baby's heart. <laughs> when the great moment arrives, the new father can expect to experience a wide range of emotions. <laughs> the joys of fatherhood really begin, and you'll soon recognize those familiar family traits. Once baby is home, many parents like the reassurance of a simple intercom device which enables them to hear baby's cries wherever they may be in the house. There are many recent innovations which allow the father to take a more active role in the feeding process. Don't expect instant success with your emphatic breasts, it takes time to learn the correct feeding techniques. As your child develops, it may be a good idea to invest in a baby bouncer. However, these can be expensive to buy, and with a little ingenuity, it's fairly simple to DIY. <laughs> Try not to force your child into unsuitable activities. Too many fathers live out their sporting fantasies through the lives of their children. <laughs> Are you happy with fatherhood? Do you find it exciting? Would you do it again? Would your wife? <laughs> well, that's the end of the first show, and uh, I think every good comedy show should finish on a song, and... Who better to sing it than Moa? <laughs> well, I'm going to do it anyway. This is a song made famous by Paul McCartney. Blackbird singing in the dead of night. 